session on uh, cellular manufacturing. We have three very interesting talks this morning. Uh, the first talk will be by sang -Yup Lee, where he'll talk about the production of amino acids in bacteria, valine, threonine. Uh, the second talk uh, will be uh, Merja Pantila uh, from BTT in, in Finland, uh, where she will talk about ethanol production in yeast. And then finally, we're going to have a very interesting talk from uh, Professor Wong from uh, HKUST, where he'll talk about the production of cosmetics uh, in bacteria. So I think it will be very interesting. Our first talk is uh, sang -Yup Lee. Uh, he is a professor of uh, chemical and biomolecular engineering at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, or KAIST. And uh, he will be talking about some of his efforts to optimize uh, the metabolic networks for amino acid production. Uh, thank you, Sam. Thank you very much, Chris. Good morning. So this is the uh, title of my talk today. I'll focus on the approaches we have taken towards the uh, development of strains which can be suitable for uh, bioprocess development. So the reason is obvious. We are living in this world where we use uh, limited fossil resources to produce all the chemicals, fuels, and materials. Now we want to move into uh, some of the uh, sustainable approaches. What can we do? Well, if you look at the, uh, this beautiful metabolic network, basically all the dots shown here are potential products, if they are useful. And they can be broadly classified as various carboxylic acids, or dicarboxylic acids, alcohols, diols, diamines, aromatics, amino acids, you name it. Of course, these metabolites can be slightly modified to produce unnatural chemicals as well. Of course, some of these chemicals belong to the family of fuels, and we heard many stories on this topic, and a couple more coming as well. And ethanol, not only the ethanol, biodiesel, but also C4 alcohols, and alkanes, and as we heard yesterday, isoprene derivatives and many others are considered as potential fuels. Materials part, we can uh, think of biopolymers first, uh, if that include polysaccharides, polyamino acids, or polyester like polyhydroxyalkanoic acids, but also you can uh, produce some unnatural polymers by modifying the uh, biopolymer synthetic pathways or in vitro polymerization of monomers and then do the chemical conversion to make these polymers. Of course, you are not limited to these polymers themselves. You can make hybrid material between organic and inorganics. Of course, all these materials will be produced not by human metabolism, but you want to employ some form of microbial cells. And uh, we have to rely on this metabolic network to get these products. However, when you isolate a bug from nature, obviously the efficiency is rather low. And that's where metabolic engineering comes into play to make this white biotechnology or industrial biotechnology viable uh, choice. And today, I want to focus on the systems approach. And the reason is clear. This is the uh, metabolic network you have to optimize. And of course, you cannot read, I cannot read. So if you blow up this region, well, you still cannot see much. Or you see the some structure. And the objective of metabolic engineer is clear. So you have your product here somewhere and you want to find the optimal path to overproduce this desirable material. We have problem as well. So not only this complex metabolic network, this metabolic network is hierarchically controlled by gene regulatory network and also signaling network, which interact with the environment. So we are talking about complex network of network of network, which is beyond my brain capacity already. However, if you think about protein-protein interaction network and protein-small molecule interaction network, which we do not know much about, it is actually network to the nth. So we are in trouble. So should we just stop manipulating it, this network and just rely on traditional methods of metabolic engineering or do what? Well, let's challenge this. We call it second generation metabolic engineering. Here now we want to integrate or mix information and also genome scale computational analysis towards the development strains by metabolic engineering. Also, you want to combine rational metabolic approaches 
and also we want to take random approaches, including random mutagenesis, etc. And also we want to include rational random approaches that include, say, transcription factor library screening and also systematic adaptive evolution. So you want to combine all these to get the metabolic engineering job done nicely. Also, it is very important to consider not only the uh, strain development, which is often performed in flask level studies. You want to consider midstream, but that is mainly fermentation, but also downstream processes all together so that the final strain you develop will perform eventually well on the actual production conditions. What kind of tools do you have? Well, there has been uh, omics evolution. Here now we are talking about genome transcription program metabolome which takes us from the genotype encoded by DNA sequence. Now we can move into phenotype by looking at the flux, that is the ultimate phenotype of cell under particular circumstances. That includes genotypes and environmental perturbing conditions. So by looking at the actual reaction rates, now you can tell the cell's cellular status for the uh, given task. And by doing so, that is analyzing the flux profiles along with other omics information, now you can integrate the uh, genome scale flux analysis into strain development policy, and also you can perform regulatory engineering. To start with, if you want to use these virtual cells for your metabolic engineering purposes, you start with the uh, complete genome sequence. Now, based on the annotation results or your own experiments, you fine tune the annotation and then build the uh, basically genome scale metabolic model using all these information. Of course, this information needs to be curated by yourselves as well, and it is also important to perform some wet experiments to validate your model, and this cycle usually runs several times until you get the actual optimized virtual cell that can be used for the simulation purposes. And as of today, about 22 uh, species have been uh, completed for building a genome scale metabolic model, and uh, many of them are available public as well, and if you look at this uh, 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 advances, it started with about 10 years ago, another person is leading this effort, and then many other organisms, not only uh, bacteria, but also fungi and even humans, genome scale uh, reconstruction is being performed. Using this model, as I stressed already, it is important to consider available raw material depending on where you are or where you're going to run the operation. You develop strains and optimize it. And synthetic biology plays a role in strain design and also optimization of this strain. But also, as I said, you need to perform fermentation and downstream processes and consider this very early stage so that you can develop the uh, integrated bioprocess, which is optimal. There are a number of products we are interested in, and this is the list of the products we have been working on. Succinic acid and other C4 are the major ones we are about to close now, finishing it and butanol and one for butane diol, important uh, alcohol and diols, amino acid, diamines, because we need some N-containing compounds for other applications, not only including nylon but others, and also secondary metabolized isoprenoids, antibiotics, and lipid fatty acid and derivatives, alkanes, and biopolymers are the products of interest in my group. And today, due to the limitation, of course, of time, and I have to focus on one, and that is amino acid. The reason for this is because amino acid biosynthetic pathway is so complicated, it is under the control of severe regulatory circuits. So this is a good model system for systems metabolic engineering. And of course, there is not only a good academic reason, but also good industrial reason. It's a huge market in the field of animal feed market, but now many chemicals are being used for the uh, derivatized product. I think Jim Liao will be talking about uh, production of isobutanol derived from the uh, branch chain amino acid pathway sometime today, I believe. So there are many uh, possibilities of these uh, amino acids. The first example is valine, which is, uh, again, branched-chain amino acid. This amino acid will be interesting because it has been reported that if you feed valine to cattle, actually it boosts up the uh, milk production. So not only the growth, but also milk production will be enhanced. So there is much interest in valine. And uh, Jin Huang Park has been working on this as, as a PhD thesis. 
So Berlin is located here. This is abbreviated metabolic network. You're starting with glycolysis and pyruvate is a key intermediate which goes down through these pathways and there are competing pathways and major ones include leucine and pantosinate and isolution which is branched off from here and coming from threonine to this way. So now if you look at this uh, amino acid biosynthetic pathway, first thing you want to see is the regulatory circuits. And he was very much disappointed by observing that there are three key enzymes for this acid for hydroxy acid synthase encoded by three types of isogymes. And one of the key enzymes, AHAS2, encoded in an upfront form, which includes these downstream enzymes. Actually, when he looked at the uh, gene sequence, there is a uh, frame shift mutation in the largest subunit of uh, AHAS2, so it is not functional in E. coli. And if you look at further, and this AHAS2 is under the uh, transcriptional attenuation control by all three branched chain amino acids. So there is no way E. coli will accumulate more than they need. And if you look at the uh, AHAS1, which is probably the most important enzyme for this flux, is also under the uh, transcriptional attenuation control by leucine and valine. So there are multiple layers of control which prohibit you to overproduce this uh, amino acid. That's not the end. If you look at the uh, genome sequence and analyze the uh, properties during the fermentation, there is a significant feedback inhibition by valine by binding to the small subunits of AS1 and AS3. So two complicated transcription attenuation control, feedback inhibition we have to take care of to start with. So uh, we constructed the base train based on this information. First, starting with just deleting, removing the uh, chromosomal attenuation control region by just uh, DNA sequence swapping. So we changed it with the uh, tech promoter by removing the whole region. And of course, tech promoter requires inducer, uh, such as IPTG, which is not desirable for valine production. So we, in addition, uh, knocked out the uh, lag I from the chromosome so that it is now constitute strong promoter. And of course, we have identified based on the literature information and also some of our own experiments, we identified a feedback inhibition site, which took a long time, and we convert it to a non-feedback version of it. And there are three enzymes, as I said, that compete with the uh, valine production. So obviously, we killed all these three genes from the chromosome by chromosomal uh, inactivation. And of course, cells no longer can make leucine pantosinate isoleucine. That means that we are converting this strain to oxotrophic mutant, which is common case for all amino acid producers because we want to overproduce that. So you feed small amounts of these uh, now oxotrophic uh, nutrients for the growth of cells. And by looking at this, now you have got lead, you know, gotten rid of all the regulatory circuits and killed branched chain competing pathways. What else can you do as a metabolic engineer? If I ask you, you will answer. Well, you amplify the first branched point that is pyruvate to, uh, to acetyl-lactate. So we did it by a plasmid-based or by expression. So first example of base strain was actually able to produce about 1.3 gram per liter of valine from 20 gram per liter glucose batch culture. So he was happy. But of course, this concentration is not good enough. So we now integrate omics information. So he performed transcriptome profiling of the valine producing versus valine non-producing strains. And then we found many interesting genes, as you normally do, probably too many. But if I summarize this complicated story, what he found was first there was some rate controlling steps. For example, if you look at the uh, AHAS enzyme flux, that was chip data shares is 30 to 50 fold higher activities as long as the uh, transcript level is concerned. But the downstream enzymes, which are important towards the formation of valine, was up, but not that quite high level. So first obvious approach it took was that we amplified these by cloning all these regions into the uh, vector, and we co-amplified it. And by doing so, we were able to double the uh, production of valine. And of course, we found that there was a, uh, some problems with the growth by amplifying five genes under the uh, medium copy number plasmid, high copy number plasmid. So we changed the uh, backbone of origin to medium copy number plasmid so that there is no growth retardation. And then still, we get the uh, good value in production. And that was the case. So without decreasing the cell growth, we were able to increase the uh, value in production. What else can we do? Well, we looked at the uh, transcriptome profile data and found that one possible regulatory protein called leucine-responsive protein 
or significantly downregulate. Of course, as the name says, it is involved in branch chain amino acid biosynthetic pathway. So we amplified it, and then we were able to increase the valine production by 20%. But as a control, when we knocked out LRP gene, we were observing that there was 36% decrease in valine production, which means that this regulatory protein serves the role of enhancing the production of valine. Also, by carefully looking at the, uh, some of the uh, overexpressed uh, proteins, we are able to identify exporter, which is important in all amino acid production conditions. The reason for we looked at the overproduced uh, transcript was that we are assuming that if cells overproduce valine, they should pump out, otherwise it will become toxic to the cell. And we've identified this protein that is called YJGH, and then uh, we use it among the uh, downstream down-regulated ones, and together with it, by observing the uh, leucine-responsive protein, regulatory protein, and along with the exoporter protein, combining those two enhance the uh, valine production by more than twofold. So, if I summarize it, what we did was we removed the feedback inhibition, we removed the uh, transcription attenuation control, and then we removed all the major competing metabolic pathways, and then we amplify the uh, key valine production pathways based on transcriptome and profiling. And then we engineer one regulatory protein. And then we engineer newly identified valine transport. And then we, all of these uh, efforts led to the uh, production of about 7.6 gram per liter of valine based on the uh, 50 gram per liter glucose equivalent. Any more targets? Please teach me. Well, let's look at this network. We did a lot of work but not quite to the level of metabolic complexity. So I was asking my student, why don't you try the combinatorial gene knockout so that you knock out some of the more competing pathways or some of the inhibitory pathways? And if you calculate it, if you want to knock out two combinatorial knockouts, you have to perform five, 500,000 experiments. If you'd want to do the uh, triple combinatorial knockout experiments, which I demanded, that's 170 million knockout experiments, which is not that fun. So we moved into genome scale simulation for knockout studies. So Taeyong, who is an in silico guy, collaborated with Jin Huan to identify the triple knockout mutant, which gives best value in production. And he suggested to Jin Huan that, well, you knock out pyruvate dehydrogenase, phosphofructokinase, malate dehydrogenase. They are located in here, in the, main, in the mainstream of glycolysis. Very important pyruvate to acetylcholate conversion, and in the right middle of the uh, TCA cycle. And this guy almost killed this guy because he thought he was joking if you look at the knockout targets. But come to think of it, and if you look at the metabolic network, actually by doing so, you can divert the metabolic flux by redirecting it towards your main precursor and hopefully towards valley. So he tried it. So he did triple knockouts, and he was very happy to see that. He was able to significantly increase the uh, yield of valine, up to now 37 gram of valine from 100 gram glucose equivalent. That means gram per gram yield is about 37.5%, which is very high. So if I summarize it, so we did, this is E. coli, we killed all the uh, regulatory circuits, which are negative to valine production. We killed all the competing pathways, and then we uh, amplified the key branch point enzyme. Using that as a base train, we performed omics studies to identify rate controlling steps and amplified, and then exporter, and regulatory proteins, and all together was the end of our rational metabolic engineering. And after that, we asked in silico E. coli, give me some targets to further improve it, and then in silico E. coli suggested triple knockout mutants, which redivided flux towards pyruvate, which is ultimately leading to the formation of valley. This approach, which I call systems metabolic engineering, can be applied to others. And another example is three which is even more complicated because, as you can see from the metabolic network, many regulatory controls at very different levels and complicated pathways and it even has a, a triple exporters, as we found later. And there is an importer, which is not good. And there is a degradation pathway as well. So it's even a little more complicated. I don't want to repeat the whole story. You can look at the paper we published. But what he did was 
we killed all the negative regulation, branched pathway that compete with the 3 in production have been removed, degradation pathway have been killed, biosynthetic pathway has been optimized, especially central carbon flux has been optimized, and 3 efflux pump has been amplified so that 3 can be efficiently go out of the cell, and byproduct formation becomes significant during fat batch, so we kill the byproduct formation. One of the interesting things I want to emphasize during this strain design was flux response analysis that is probably more relevant to you guys on synthetic biology. The reason for that is when we found that PPC, that is PP carboxylase, which basically makes C3 compound to C4 to a threonine efflux, was found to be limiting. So this is the uh, current flux level, about 4 millimolar per gram DCW per hour. Now, if you simulate, what happens was that from here, we are here, if you increase the PPC flux, you will be theoretically increasing your threonine flux. So we wanted to amplify it. But when we amplified it using high copy number plasmid, threonine production was actually decreasing. So we went back to simulation and we expanded the window and then we observed up to 100 millimole per gram DCW per hour during the simulation. And interestingly, this is what we found. That means that if you increase the PPC flux to a certain point, that is up to this point, then you will increase your 3 unit flux. But if you further increase it, actually 3 unit flux becomes decreased. And where does that energy go or that carbon flux go? Well, it was found to go to biomass instead. So there is optimal point that is here we want to achieve. How we do that? Well, synthetic biology. So you want to optimize the expression level. Unfortunately, there is no linear relationship between activity and gene copy number or transcript level or protein level. So you have to do some trial and error type studies, which we did. And what we did is summarize here. So we killed all the uh, negative regulatory circuits, feedback inhibitions from the direct chromosomal engineering. And then we amplify the uh, efflux pump. We kill the uh, degradation pathway. We killed import pathway, and now optimize the central fluxes. And here is PPP, PPC, which is important towards the uh, bringing this OAA into threonine flux pathways. Now this was amplified by chromosomal replacement of its original promoter with a strong constitutive TRC promoter in the lag I deletion condition. By doing so, instead of using high copy plasma, you increase the PPC flux just to the level you want. And then by doing so, we were able to achieve about 39% yield of threonine. And Guangwu, who did this, all this beautiful work, was from company. So he was not have satisfied with only strain development. He also performed the actual fat batch culture to produce it. So now you're looking at about 82 grams per liter of threonine production, which is not quite that level of actual industrial production, which is about 120 grams per liter probably. But this is without optimization and also 100% rationally engineered E. coli strain. That is the uh, essence of this result. We also use various tools. I already introduced you the knockout simulation. The simulation tool we use is called F-Scope. Of course, they are off knock by Costas Maranas, BOMA by George Church's group. Beautiful algorithms for simulating gene knockout targets. But we have this uh, multi-objective uh, target identification algorithms that allow biomass uh, combined with the byproduct and your product, and you want to find the optimal level to, uh, to achieve your desired bioprocess. And this algorithm will give you basically targets to uh, knock out. That is no problem. One of the interesting things will be basically if you want to design, for example, homo acetic acid producer, you can run F-scope algorithm and then identify a point which allows the best homo acetic acid production. And in this particular case, double knockout simulation shows these two genes. And by only deleting two genes, actually you can shift E. coli metabolism towards nearly, not all, almost, but nearly homo acetic acid uh, former. And you can see that actual experiment shows that there is some discrepancy, but this is due to the uh, limited size of genome scale model. So identifying gene knockout targets. How am I doing it time? Okay. So identifying gene knockout targets is relatively easy to the people who run it because you can set the uh, flux 
those corresponding fluxes to zero during the simulation because you knocked it out. But we also sometimes, and actually often, want to identify gene amplification targets, which is rather difficult. And the reason is, as you all know, there is no direct relationship between the level of gene dosage towards the final flux. And there are multiple hierarchical unknowns, which makes you no way to uh, understand or predict. So what can we do? So we developed this algorithm called flux scanning based on enforced objective flux that is, in short, something like this. So this is a basically dual optimization where you do the biomass formation rate on one axis, and this is your desired product formation rate. This is the uh, current strain you operate. So this is the point you are getting because cells always, especially cells like E. coli, always want to achieve maximum biomass formation. I don't know their life objective, but that's probably it. So this is the point actually you're getting. So this is the growth rate you're getting, and this is the product formation rate. If you simulate with the maximum product formation as an objective function, I don't care about your growth, just give me my product. Then this is the simulation results. So you get huge increase in your product formation, but obviously no growth, because all the flux has been diverted to here. So this is theoretical maximum production point, which is not achievable in real bioprocess unless you run the uh, two-stage fermentation where the other stage is resting cell. Again, in, under that particular circumstances, you still need maintenance energy as well. So how are we going to bring up this towards this direction? Well, that's what we did. So you artificially increase your product formation rate. That is called enforced flux, objective flux. And then follow up the, uh, all the intracellular fluxes and identify those fluxes increased together with your enforced objective flux. So that's what we did, and we identified several things using several examples. And the example I'm going to share with you today is lycopene production. So hyung who uh, recently graduated, did a beautiful job on running FSOF algorithm on lycopene producers. So these are the heterologous pathway introduced uh, from Arvinia and others to form the lycopene in E. coli. Now, this is a very complicated slide, but to make an essence out, out of this figure is that red basically means that it should be increased towards the enforced objective uh, formation, and blue means down-regulated. So he identified about 38 gene amplification targets out of 1,000 fluxes, and then he constructed this plasmid, which I think is doable, where if it's about 200, it's, I should say, is at least not doable in the lab in university. But so he did all these combinatorial amplifications, and he was able to stepwise increase the lycopene production by amplifying the gene amplification targets identified in silico. And he was smart enough to combine these two effects, and at the end, by co-amplifying IDI and malate dehydrogenase, he was getting the highest yield of <coughs> lycopene production. Of course, he, did, he didn't stop there. So this is the uh, gene amplification targets identified f -SOF, and this is gene deletion targets by f -SCOF, which I briefly mentioned. As you can see, these two results interestingly tell us that we're actually gene amplification targets has more significant impact on increasing our product formation. Of course, the reason he did both gene amplification and gene knockout study is to combine them. So he combined them, and at the end, he was able to identify the final beautiful strain that produces lycopene to very high level. And he also performed fed batch culture for the production of lycopene. Well, but trust me, this is not like tomato, so don't try to eat E. coli. But nonetheless, it produces a good amount of lycopene. That is 300 milligram per liter of lycopene. This is uh, okay, not great to the level we are achieving with other products. But the reason for this low tyra is that because it's a membrane chelator, so it is very difficult to achieve a very high density. So production of the uh, bioproducts, I have shared three examples and several approaches of using systems and synthetic approaches. Now I think we are at the stage of uh, using this global systems biological information and not only just do the local engineering, but we are at the uh, stage of semi-global. We cannot probably say that we are doing global metabolic engineering, but at least we are talking about semi-global engineering. So we can say that we are doing a systems metabolic engineering, which is basically aiming towards genome scale synthetic biology. If I summarize, this is a task you have. So when you develop strains, you perform systems metabolic engineering. You have to combine rational metabolic engineering, random and rational random approaches. You have to be selectively, uh, uh, you have to select a nice host strain, 
and then heterologous combination of proteins, pathways, and regulations need to be performed. Control of gene expression is important, regulatory engineering, and you have to optimize their meat to a downstream processes during your strain development. Protein enzyme engineering to create new enzymes or new pathways, new reactions, adaptive evolution, so you just let the nature do the job for you, but you have to provide rational selection schemes, and of course you want to use all the systems biology and synthetic biology tools to achieve these goals. So this is the very large list of things to do for strain development, but again, you want to perform midstream and downstream processes all together so that you don't have to be uh, disappointed by seeing your cell not performing well in 200,000 liter fermenter at the end. Some of the uh, stories, because I had only limited time, will be uh, published in this collective book contributed by many, many great authors, and we are expecting this book to be published in probably sometime next year. And I have a small announcement, which is relevant to our synthetic biology. There is an engineering foundation conference series called Metabolic Engineering, which is already eighth, which means that now it's the 16th year running away. And that will be held in Jeju Island in Korea. In, uh, this is a fixed date, so June 13 to 18, 2010. As your science is solid, I don't want to talk about it. There are some tourist attractions. And there is a reason I talk about this. So very nice spots. I don't want to show you too much. It's a basically nature, natural beauty, and it's a UNESCO selected uh, uh, preservatories as well. And lots of uh, things to see and do in Jeju Island. So hope to see you in Jeju Island in Korea. But I think you have to act very fast once I un announce it, because uh, the seats are limited to uh, 300. So the work I presented today are supported by Ministry of Education, Science and Technology, Ministry of Technology Economy, and a couple of companies including LG Chem and GS Caltex have been great sponsors. So in silico work has been supported by Microsoft and IBM, and all the work I presented today were performed by my group members, and I thank you for their effort, and I also want to thank you for your kind attention. Sangha, with your um, very elegant presentation, over here. Hi, Peter. Have you reached the stage where you'd be better to really control your E. coli so you get a growth stage and then turn off growth and get a production stage? Yes, that is also possible. You can basically arrest cell growth and pump your flux, all the carbon flux, to your product. And the way you do it is basically making a uh, expression system sort of inducible by the growth stage. So by after certain time, that is saying, in, say a fed wedge culture, you just let cells grow until say 10 to 15 gram per liter dry cell weight basis, and then you just do not allow any more the cell growth and you shift the flux by adjusting the expression of different metabolic genes and then just shift the flux towards your uh, optimal uh, direction.